WTAL News Now, live with Brittany Dufresne.
KTAL News Now, live with Brittany Dufran. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here in the KTAL News Now Digital Streaming Center. My name is Brittany Dufran, and we're here breaking news to you live, reporting on breaking news and developing stories in real time. We're covering the most important stories of the day and diving deep into issues that matter most to you. So our NBC6 news team has been following this trial since day one. Thanks to our digital executive producer and courtroom reporter, Carolyn Roy, we've been able to get an inside look of this courtroom. And so today we're going to go ahead and break down this week's events and I'm going to bring her in here. So just before we get started, I want to catch everyone up and tell you guys a little bit about how we got here. So um, let's take a look. Let's get everyone caught up. A Bowie County jury convicted Taylor Parker on October 3rd of capital murder and kidnapping in the death of 21 year old Reagan Hancock and her unborn baby Braxton Sage. From there, it took the state about three weeks and the defense another two to present the same jury evidence and testimony to help them determine whether Taylor Parker would get the death penalty or life in prison. Well, this week, the jury finally deliberated and chose the sentence to sentence Parker with the death penalty. So we'll talk about it all. We'll talk about how everything went down, um, those last moments and where she is now. So let's get into it. All right, we're going to start off here with the first question and talking a little bit about, you know, we left off with the defense bringing their witnesses to the stand and the prosecution going a little heavy handed in that cross examination. We talked a little bit about that last week. And so now as we look to, you know, where we picked up this week, the defense was waiting on a neurologist they wanted to bring to the stand. So what was the insight that this neurologist provided to the jury? Can you help us there out, Carolyn? Well, if you're talking about the neurologist that the defense brought to the stand or the forensic um, psychologist uh, that they brought to the stand, the state brought to the stand in rebuttal, because there's a, there's a first of all, there was a neurologist that uh, the defense brought in um, who testified that about Parker's, as the defense uh, team put it, brain is broken. Um, and so he did testify this week that uh, using scans that he had ordered, um, to show that there were gaps in Parker's brain um, that indicate uh, frontal lobe dysfunction because of atrophied tissue, a actual sort of um, regressing or, or shrinking brain tissue that he said it was um, one of the reasons that you could, um, you know, blame Parker's behavior on um, the the lying um, and the impulsivity and uh, those kinds of things, and of course the, the murder itself. So that was what the defense had um, from that w neurologist uh, on the stand. And then the state brought in um, a couple of, well, the state actually had a couple of two forensic psychologists who examined Parker, one before the trial began and one um, actually in the middle of the trial, October, uh, during the penalty phase of the trial, as a matter of fact, and they had, um, course some counter testimony to that neurologist testimony but the state also pointed out that none of the other scans none of the other doctors that had done scans over the period of 10 years that um, records medical records were gathered for the case um, saw any such um, frontal lobe dysfunction and so um, and which by the way you know it was explained by the neurologist that that frontal lobe area of the brain is what governs executive function and decision making so that was the connection that the defense was trying to make and the prosecution said, look, all these records, none of the scans taken all these years were nothing was ever picked up on those that, you know, would have um, that got anyone's, you know, attention and, or, and certainly didn't note that kind of um, brain damage. Basically, they also put up a, a scan of an actual example of a patient with that kind of atrophy, the severe atrophy that the neurologist for the defense claimed on the stand. And there was a very drastic difference in the two. People with that kind of, of brain atrophy um, are, have to live in assisted living, often don't remember their own children or grandchildren and, and you know need to be even like taken to the bathroom or wear diapers. So obviously Parker is not in that state was the prosecution's point. And then so so there was this kind of claim of a broken brain that was thrown out there. Can you tell us about that and if that made any um, impact for the the jury? Well, that's exactly what the neurologist was testifying to that we were just talking about. Um, so 
obviously the jury didn't buy it in the end, as we know, the, uh, the, uh, the sentence that came back pretty quickly, and we'll be talking about that in a moment, I'm sure. Um, but that was, that was the gist of it. You know, there was a little bit more about how um, he, the neurologist for the defense, wanted to basically say that confabulation, basically telling a lot of lies, fantastical lies, is the same as um, pathological lying. And the defense or the state really kind of went at that from several different angles and with, with more than one witness to say it's not the same, um, that people are, that uh, are lying because of some kind of brain damage or not even brain damage, but just um, from, you know, inhibitions of when they're part, that part of the brain kind of stops you from saying or doing things that are, um, you know, inappropriate or whatever, that executive function area. Um, there are some people who um, are quote unquote lying because they're filling in gaps of things they can't remember, but they don't realize they're lying. That's different than pathological liars, as the witnesses put it, as the state's experts put it, um, which is, you know, ongoing lies on top of lies that they are aware that, that, that they're telling, even though some pathological liars, according to the experts, um, can come to believe their lies. So that was all kind of wrapped up in that broken brain um, argument that the prosecution obviously successfully batted down. And then was that also maybe in an attempt to, um, you know, bring into question if Parker would or would not be a threat to the public or to others in the future? That, that was a big part of the argument that for both, uh, well, for the state to convince the jury that um, because it's critical under under Texas law, capital murder sentencing requires the jury to consider whether a, an inmate is a, someone who's been convicted of a capital crime does pose a threat of future danger. So um, that is something that the state really hammered on um, during their um, making their case during the penalty phase and during closing arguments and in the rebuttal. Um, they were basically pointing to all the scheming that um, they say Parker's been doing since she's even been in jail. Um, even on the second day of this last week of the trial, you know, so within 24 hours of when um, Parker was probably, you know, well, when the sentencing was expected to happen, um, there was contraband found in her or her cell. There was a shakedown of her cell on Tuesday morning. Um, and so when we came back from a break, I want to say, in the morning, uh, Tuesday morning, the judge had a box on his desk in the courtroom and he... Uh, had, I think he took like a 40 minute break to go into like, he might've been during lunch, but anyway, he went through the box of things that were found in her, her cell. And, um, you know, he sort of pulled them all. This was with the jury out of the room, but he pulled them all out, um, and sort of categorized them. There were love letters or personal letters that had nothing to, you know, nothing to do with the case, weren't contraband. Um, but then there was a schematic of the jail, a color coded schematic of the annex though, not the by state detention center. So the annex is across the street from the, the by state where Parker's being held. But um, it was a schematic of the of the annex though. So that seemed odd and prosecutors kind of wanted to make, to make sure the jury saw that. There's a little bit of an argument about whether the jury needed to see any of this contraband that was found in her cell. The prosecution um, won that argument. Um, so also found in the cell though, in addition to the color-coded schematic with Parker's name on it and the date, January, 2021, <clears throat> um, was a, a shaving razor that was jail issued, but Parker should not have had it in her cell. They're supposed to give it back after. And I think because she was in ad seg, she shouldn't have had it at all. Um, and then the other piece of contraband, there were two other things that were notable. One was such a, a wire from a headphones. Those are jail issued headphones, but it looked like it had been stripped out. And a sunflower mask, which is the very sunflower mask that Reagan Hancock's family um, saw Parker wearing during some of her pre-trial hearings. As you recall, this happened during sort of the height of COVID. Um, so there were some pre-trial hearings where Parker showed up in a, a gray mask with um, sunflowers printed on it. And so because the state did win the argument to be able to enter those, the, the new contraband into evidence, uh, they were able to show the jury those items. Um, so the defense had to come back and, and kind of put their spin on what all that meant. But Basically, what the state was saying was, here we are, 24 hours, you know, a day out, in the final hours, basically, of her sentencing trial, um, where we're supposed to be, you know, the jury is supposed to be deciding whether she gets life in prison to continue maybe scheming if the, you know, if you, as the state argued, uh, or death row, 
you know, the death sentence where she would be much more locked down for most of the day. She'd be with, you know, in an area that security is much tighter. They don't go anywhere uh, without guard and without being shackled at the um, hands and feet. Uh, and they don't get that much time out of their cell as opposed to, you know, the general population, which I think we talked about this a little bit last week, but where she would have been housed with, you know, in a dorm with 34 other inmates um, and a lot more time to, to scheme. So the argument anyway was, you know, as you asked about future dangerousness, you know, the kind of the, the success of the penalty phase of the trial from the state's perspective was convincing the jury that she did pose a future danger. And clearly they did that because that was the verdict was the death penalty. Yeah, so it, it really sounds like um, they were able to paint that picture for the jury in regards to, as you mentioned, you know, her being able, having the ability to scheme and the, the, the lengths that she's able to kind of accomplish that, the things that she's able to hold in her cell. Um, and then for the, other, oh, sorry. no, no, it's okay. Well, there were other arguments. I don't want to make it sound like the only argument they had for future dangerousness was necessarily about the contraband mm -hmm. or even the jail scheming. Um, there were there was extensive testimony from those two forensic psychologists who sat down with Parker, like I said, one before the trial and one during, um, that revealed more details from Parker's perspective about what happened in the in the months leading up to the murder, and yet another version of the story that she has told, um, and it included you know again details once again details that you know, the killer would know, only the killer would know, um, but also a little bit more insight into her state of mind and what she claims happened on that morning um, and the night before. Uh, and the state basically used that to show just how, once again, um, cold-blooded the crime was, how it was um, planned and premeditated it, to, enough of, to enough of a degree um, to convince the jury uh, that she deserved the death penalty. Uh, but also, um, there was something else about it. I'm I lost my train of thought on that, but we'll probably come back to it. But the, but the, the forensic psychologist um, took up a, a good bit of the testimony in, in this final week of the trial, and it really went over um, how she was claiming that Parker, or that Reagan was gonna ha actually help her get out of this pregnancy lie, that Reagan knew, um, either knew already or Parker confessed to her that she was faking the pregnancy and did not know what to do. Like she, that's what she told the um, the state's expert witnesses in her interviews with them. That she was backed into a corner fully, um, that she dug a hole way too deep to get out of. And in the end, she didn't want to, <coughs> excuse me, she didn't want to, um, I think she agreed, well, I think Reagan basically, according to her version of it, um, initially agreed to help her, but that they supposedly knew it was going to take an even bigger lie to cover up the lie of the pregnancy. And so when Taylor got there um, the morning of the murder, she claims Reagan, she thought, had changed her mind. Parker started getting paranoid because she told Reagan a lot of things that could send her to prison. Um, and that she described Reagan looking at her uh, like someone who was about to put it down an animal. And the prosecution called this um, projection, you know, that basically you're saying somebody else is doing something that you're actually doing. So the prosecution's argument during their closing arguments to the jury was it was Parker that was looking at Reagan like she was about to put down an animal. But from Parker's, Parker's version of the story anyway was that she thought maybe Reagan was backing out and she knew too much that she did not plan to kill Reagan, but that she doesn't remember the actual act. She just remembers putting her hand on Reagan's shoulder and asking her to help, or at least thinking about asking her to help, please help. Um, again, she claims she blacked out, and then when she came to and saw what she did, um, according to her, she uh, apparently the thought crossed her mind that she needed to kill herself, but she didn't. She decided that she needed to, that supposedly still, even in this version, she and Reagan decided to take the baby, um, for, for Parker to take the baby. Um, so there was, a, there was a lot in that testimony. That's online, the details about, you know, what she told those forensic investigators. But what, what the prosecutors basically took from that and presented to the jury was, um, you know, excuse me, <coughs> the brutality of the crime, yet another version 
um, of events. Maybe this one had a few more grains of truth in it, um, but it still didn't go down the way. You know, Parker, of course, framed it, which was that Reagan um, was was helping her, and that it wasn't it wasn't the plan to to kill her. She even told those forensic um, psychologists that she was tracking and stalking and knew the patterns of one of the patients outside the cl the clinic in in Paris, uh, a pregnant patient. You know, we've heard that that Parker was going to um, the Paris clinic repeatedly. Um, day after day after day in the days following the anonymous text to um, uh, Wade Griffin from her ex-husband just warning him she's not pregnant she's gonna have to come up with a baby all that and so um, she supposedly confessed to Reagan that she had been knew this woman's patterns and that was the one that she Reagan even asked her well did you plan to hurt her because I think she told her that she was you know thinking about it taking that woman's baby so clearly Reagan knew too much it should shed some light another possible motive basically for for Parker taking Reagan's life oh yeah no I mean and so you already touched on this a little bit but um I was kind of follow up with you know those details that you know the version that Parker shared with those uh the forensic witnesses was a, oh, another version of the story itself um so it's just very interesting that like, you know, throughout all this time of this in trial since day one, there's been just so many different versions of what happened. And then even you saying um, that the prosecution said that there was maybe a little bit more of a truth to this version. So well, I don't know if the prosecution said that there was a truth to it. Just from my observations, you get the sense that it, it, it opens up the possibility because I think we're all wondering what exactly did happen because she had the bit tranquilizer in her purse she had um she it feels i feel like it hasn't really been touched on much even by the prosecution but there was a gun on the front seat passenger seat of the car when she was pulled over it was recovered from the vehicle so she had a tranquilizer she had a gun um it did it, and by the, the nature of the crime scene it didn't look like it was very well necessarily planned or executed um it was, it was a violent messy um murder and um so I think she was stalking all these other places and this particular woman in Paris. Why did she kill Reagan? So to me, I'm just thinking, is she giving these forensic psychologists a little bit more insight into what her motivation really was, even if she didn't tell the story that way, um, you know, because she still wanted to make herself look better than, than what she'd done. All right, well, let's move forward a little bit here and talk a little bit about the defense's closing argument. Um, what was it that stood out about what they said? Or could you just give us a brief description of how they kind of closed their argument? So the defense's closing arguments basically hinged on Taylor's family and the system in general failing her. They talked about how so many people knew that she was not pregnant and they talked to each other about it, but they never confronted her directly, he said. Um, and we did hear that throughout the trial from the witnesses. You know, they'd often say, well, we figured it would work itself out. Um, Shauna Pryor, uh, Parker's mother, said that on the stand. Several others did. Um, others thought it would end in a miscarriage, a fake miscarriage. Um, so he, he, talk, he touched on that. He touched on, um, of course, the future dangerousness argument. Um, you know, he dismissed the state's attempt to um, sort of uh, imp to downplay um, their neurologist expert who claimed that Parker suffered that frontal lobe dysfunction because of brain atrophy, um, because the state had brought up a picture of a, a whole, you know, some anonymous patient who actually had it. He sort of, he said, you know, they're gonna, you're gonna, they're gonna pull a scan, a Google a, a CAT scan. Um, you know, you don't have to listen to everything the state says, they said, uh, the defense attorney, Jeff Harrelson said, um, but the main thing was that the system let her down, that, you know, whether you want to believe it or not, that she claimed that she was um, abused um, sexually as a child when her father supposedly took her over to a, a girlfriend's house or a drug house to visit a girlfriend, um, and that she, you know, di didn't have, she, her parents were divorced, so it was a difficult childhood, those kinds of things. He also read from the, a few verses from the Bible, which uh, uh, were about, you know, turning the other cheek um, which I think some people 
um, kind of took offense to in, in the gallery. I don't know about the jury, um, but you know, they're not the only ones. The defenses aren't the only ones that read from verses. So did the prosecution, actually. Would you, if you can point out the um, like the top two moments that stood out to you on each side, what would you say those would be for you? Pro- well. For the defense side, I think it I think it is just the claim that the system failed Parker and, and trying to p- kind of put the blame on other people for not doing more, um, I would say, for that. And then on the prosecution side, probably there was a lot. There was a, the assistant district attorney, um, Lauren Richards, did the first, did, did the actual closing arguments. Then the defense presented their closing arguments. And then Kelly Crisp came in to uh, do the rebuttal um, argument before the jury uh, was sent out to deliberate. And I would say, <coughs> excuse me again, um, Lauren was cool as a cucumber and clear as a bell. Um, she used a PowerPoint to show uh, all of the scheming and uh, basically the, to remind the jurors of all of this testimony and evidence that had been presented throughout the trial. So she kind of laid that foundation again, ticked it all off. Um, but you know, she said, if um, anybody deserves the death penalty, wouldn't it be Taylor Parker? Um, when Crisp came up um, and and had to rebut what Harrelson was saying about um, trying to kind of, de- first of all, trying to blame the failure of the system, but also trying to blame others, um, and his argument that she's, you know, you, you don't have to listen to the state. It's she wasn't as she wasn't misbehaving in jail as much as they say. You saw that they had somebody in there braiding her, her hair. Um, you saw her stay out too late one night to watch herself on TV. But really, you know, it wasn't as bad as they were claiming. Well, Kelly Crisp came back um, and just hammered that. Uh, she pulled up a photo actually of the crime scene, and there was no warning that that was going to happen. The judge did say, I don't think he's, no, there was no warning. Um, so there were people in the in the courtroom who weren't ready for that. It was very full courtroom, um, standing room only, a lot of family members in there. Many of them have been here for the trial, but a lot of them couldn't be in the courtroom because they were witnesses. Others are, you know, family that might live elsewhere and, and could only come for this part of the trial. So a lot of people in there who had not seen that all of a sudden we're looking at a projection from the crime scene of, of Reagan's body. And it was a very graphic image. So on top of basically the first assistant district attorney said, you know, this is the, this is the level of violence that Parker is capable of. Um, this shows you the coldness. This is part of the argument that the state made about um, the telling the jury that they could choose the death penalty and choose future dangerousness basically based on the, facts of the case alone, um, the heinousness of this crime. Um, so she used the picture to, to drive that point home. Um, she talked about Parker leaving the, the three-year-old uh, in the house with her mother's body, uh, doing this in the house with the child there and the child seeing it, even though Parker denied that the child saw it, there's plenty of evidence to indicate that she did. Um, and we heard some of it from the child's grandmother, from Reagan's mother, um, about some of the things that she's told them um, in the two years since the murder that only this child could have known if she had seen this horrible, you know, witness her mother's murder, basically. Uh, so, um, she, Kelly Crisp also talked about um, reminding the jury of what kind of life Parker would have on death row as opposed to in the general population for life in prison. Um, and how they can have jobs um, f- in the general population. Um, she pointed to some of the jobs that, that someone like Parker could get. But she also, I think kind of colorfully, um, but effectively, was saying that they sew, as one of the jobs in prison, is they sew the Texas flag. And she went on a kind of a little tear about how Taylor Parker doesn't deserve to put her hands on the Texas flag. She did, went over the colors that um, are on that flag and what they represent. Um, hers was a much more emotional sort of big close, and it worked. There were people crying in the in the courtroom by the time she was done, uh, and I would say both Lauren Richards and Kelly Crisp's um, uh, work on that those closing arguments were clearly effective, as the jury didn't take long to come back with that verdict. 
Um, I don't think this is something that maybe we've talked about on the live. I'm sure that the details about this are in um, some of the articles that we've written up and put on ktalnews.com where you can uh, go and catch up on um, everything that we've covered since day one. But we even have a question here in the comment section about um, what specifically has uh, she shared about what she's, see she's seen um, uh the, the child and, and the, what the grandmother has yeah. said. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm not sure we've talked about that on the live before. No, yeah, we haven't yet. That was more testimony this week um, that came when uh, Jessica Brooks took the stand again and talked about more ab about the hardship that this, you know, it's not just hardship, but how this has affected their lives um, and talked about how the little girl, um, and I'm just trying not to say her name if I, I'm going to try not to slip, but that um, whenever she sees, whenever this, who's she's five now. Um, so over the last couple of years, whenever she sees a pregnant woman, she wants to see their belly. She wants them to lift their shirts and see their belly, according to Jessica Brooks, because she wants to make sure they're not bleeding. It's um, sad. Uh, she talked about how Jessica wears a, a heart locket um, on a necklace and, with a picture of the, the little family, Rig and Homer and, and their daughter. Um, and in the picture, Reagan is wearing a red shirt and her daughter doesn't, uh, the, her little girl does not like to see that picture because the shirt is red and it looks like blood. <clears throat> Jessica Brooks also said that her daughter has just told them things that even they didn't know. Um, and there was testimony earlier in the trial too about how, how the little girl, um, you know, a, a, an officer took the stand just for a few minutes to just establish that when he came to the was called to the crime scene that day uh, he was put in charge of taking pictures of some some blood on the little girl on her on the bottom of her foot and on her arm so she was I mean as bloody as that crime scene was if she'd have been in the living room at the time I would suspect that she would have a lot more blood on her um, so that suggests to me although the you know I don't think the state really got too much into it um, but that she was she was in there somewhere but not necessarily she couldn't have possibly gotten close to her mother unless the blood got wiped off because there was just a lot all over the floor it was a pool of blood so clearly she saw horrible horrible things and and Jessica talked about how they're you know they're trying to help her in the best way possible they let her draw and they're kind of um she's in you know she has therapy or access to therapy at least um, so, you know, they're doing their, the best they can to support her. Yeah, I think, I mean, anyone could agree with this, like just knowing um, that she is so young and possibly did see this. I mean, um, yeah, that's, that's really tough to hear. Um, but, okay, so let's move uh, forward a little bit here. So, because, I mean, you know, this is just one testimony. I mean, it, it's interesting to hear that that was new from this week. Um, but of course, you know, this has been going for like almost two months now. Um, so much testimony, so much evidence presented to this jury, and then they only take a, about an hour, an hour, a little over an hour, over an hour, a little over an hour to deliberate and come with a verdict. Tell us a little bit about that, or if you, is there any insight on in regards to how long they took and, and moments after that? Yeah, it felt like it all went very quickly, actually, after closing arguments. Um, the, it, like you said, it took a little over an hour, about I don't even, 15 minutes in, after they'd left to deliberate, they came back with a request for a couple of items. One, a whiteboard or a piece of paper. Uh, uh, and then two, a list of evidence and documents that were presented in the trial. So they wanted things like, um, there was a handout, that the prosecutors had shown the jury when uh, they were talking about the different types of personality disorders and the ones that the experts had found that um, Parker it seemed to feature. Um, but actually, that was one of the few pieces of evidence that were, I think, shown to the jury but not entered into evidence, so the judge couldn't send them that. But basically, it sounded like they wanted to just make sure that they were, they understood correctly what personality disorders the experts said Parker featured, basically, or exhibited. Um, but other things were like uh, included the medical examiner's report on baby Braxlin, um, some transcripts, um, and a number of other items. And so that made it seem like, well, maybe this won't be a quick, you know, 
a, a quick deliberation because um, that's a lot of stuff to look over. But sure enough, some 40, 45 minutes later, they were back with that verdict. And as I uh, uh, have learned since then, there was never any question about what the jurors um, were leaning toward when they went into deliberation. It's just that they wanted to make sure that they were being thorough about the considerations that they're asked under the law to, to take into account when they're making um, their decisions about each of the two special questions they have to answer. One, of course, being, are they a future danger, like I've mentioned, um, and the other, are there any mitigating circumstances, which I haven't really gotten into here, but there was a lot of the closing arguments for both the defense and the state were about that too, the mitigating, well, I mentioned it, you know, the d difficult childhood and all that, which by the way, the state argued, you could look at some of the things that the defense was arguing as mitigating were actually aggravating if you consider that some of them were fabrications according to the state, so, but anyway. As far as the jury goes, um, it was not like there was a holdout that had to be sort of somehow come around. Um, it was more like, let's be thorough about uh, let's be thorough about this, basically, um, before we come back and, and give the verdict to the judge. So, And then they come back and, um, you know, provide the judge with uh, the verdict, and it's read out. Can you tell us a little bit about the reaction um, in the courtroom, maybe Taylor Parker's reaction yeah. as well? Yeah. Well, when the jury gave notice that it was, that it had a verdict, um, Taylor was brought back into the courtroom, and she was, at that point, um, clearly already crying um, and upset. Uh, but as she sat there, when the judge finally read the notice, because when they first came back, I think a signature was missing off of the form. The foreman, They had to send the jury out, have the foreman sign that final confirmation, yes, this is our decision, brought him back in. So you know, Taylor was sitting there for a little bit, waiting for that to get done. Um, but she sat very still while the judge was actually reading those forms um, out loud. They have to, he, he, listed each of the special questions that they have to answer and, and then said what the jury's response was. And of course, to the um, future danger, the answer was yes, she's a future danger. And to the mitigating, are there mitigating circumstances that would have overridden her, um, her, 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 let's see, how do I put this? I need to pull up the question. But basically, are there mitigating circumstances not to excuse, but to override the fact that she did it um, and to give her life in prison instead of the, you know, the death penalty. Um, but the answer to that ultimately was no. Um, none of the things that the defense presented or argued during this trial and the penalty phase um, is enough to override the fact of the murder itself and the actions um, that Parker was convicted of. So still, Parker really didn't flinch when the judge read those answers. Um, she did, really wasn't even, besides crying, but um, our, her back was to us at that point, so we really couldn't see. Um, the judge has to pull each of the jurors in a capital murder trial, uh, penalty trial. Um, so they each say, you know, yes, uh, I agree with this verdict, or that's my decision. Um, by the way, and some of those jurors were emphatic in their yeses. Um, Still not much of a reaction from Parker that we could tell from behind, but when the judge said, I'm not gonna formally sentence you, and he formally sentenced her, you could see her shaking, and, and then you could really tell that she was she was she appeared to be crying. They were pretty quick about standing her up at that point and handcuffing her behind the back and taking her to the stand so that um, Reagan's family could do their victim statements. I will say when the court, when the judge was reading the, the jury form, with the answers on, you know, once they answer the first question, you know, yes, there, she's a future danger. And as soon as he read out that they, that they had said no to mitigating, everyone knew what that meant and meant death penalty. The judge had warned the courtroom to remain silent, I think is how he put it. But there was still sort of a jolt of people kind of sucking their breath in like, you know, do we, did that just happen? It's what, what because there was no one in the courtroom that was uh, from Parker's family, it was filled with people who were there to support Reagan's family or that they were Reagan's family themselves. It was, it was the verdict that most of the people in the courtroom wanted. So it was a, a shock of him, relief, 
excitement. I, I, I hate to say excitement, but there was definitely like a a jolt. And that's yeah. that's what Reagan's family wanted. So I'm yeah. I'm sure they were they were happy. They yeah. were they were pleased with what that verdict was. There was a lot of hugging, a lot of crying, a lot of back rubbing, and and just yeah. And so you already said this, but none of Parker's family. Did you, you didn't even, what, did you get a sense of that there were any friends maybe or any of the witnesses that came for the defense's side? Was, was there anyone that was in support of her? Not that, not that I am aware of. There might have been someone in there. You know, there were people there from, from the team, the Capitol defense team. Um, but as far as like family or friends or supporters, if there were any in there, they didn't make themselves known and probably understandably. But definitely her her father and mother were not there um so <clears throat> yeah. right and then so we look a little bit more forward here and so from that moment that the verdict is read you know how quickly did things move and and where is parker now right. well one of the things that the judge said once the state and we should talk about the victim statements too because they were very touching obviously and emotional but we, we can do that um once the victim statements were were read Judge Tidwell um, said, you can remove her and take her to death row. Now, he was probably not meaning that literally, but what we didn't know at the time was that, because for security reasons, they don't want to say when an inmate's being transferred, but after the whole incident with the, her jail cell being shaken down and the contraband being found, um, they probably had had it with her at the Bowie County um, Bi-State Detention Center. So I've learned since that they did go ahead and start uh, the paperwork for transferring her into the Texas Department of Correctional, uh, sorry, Criminal Justice Correctional System. Um, regardless of what her sentence was, she was going to Gatesville because that's in t where they house both um, the death row inmates um, and the lifers and everything in between. Uh, so they went ahead and started the paperwork. They had that going um, in order to just expedite her removal from Bowie County. Uh, so within hours, she was indeed on her way to Gatesville and word about that spread quickly. Like I said, though, they usually, and I know that it wasn't released by any officials, um, but somebody might've seen the van or maybe people, you know, kind of realized retroactively that the judge was knew that she was gonna be headed very shortly, maybe to the processing facility, because she doesn't go directly to death row. As a matter of fact, as of this afternoon, she's still not listed as being on death row. Um, but at Gatesville, it's a really large complex. I think there's like five prisons on that, in that Gatesville um, prison complex. And they first they go to the Christina Crane unit, all inmates do, for processing in before they go to their assigned um, facility. In her case, female death row inmates are housed at the Mountain View unit there at Gatesville. So she's not, a, as far as I can tell, but it's a holiday too. Um, she's not quite in that separate Mountain View unit with the other female death row inmates, um, but she is in Gatesville being processed. Um, and then so you mentioned that, um, yeah, like I think it's a great idea if we can maybe shed a little light in regards to some of the victim statements and um, mm -hmm. what was shared during that time. I'm sure it was very emotional to hear. It was. It was. Um, I'm going to try to pull up, actually, because I want to make sure I get that right. But I can tell you the first uh, there were three victim statements. Um, from, the first was from Emily Simmons, Reagan's younger sister, her baby sister. And Emily is getting ready to get married soon. So. Um, for her, it's especially, you know, s s sad because she, her sister's not going to be there for that big day, not for her bachelorette party, um, not for the, all the things that they used to do together. Um, so she read a, a statement and, and um, she held it together pretty good, but she was very difficult for her, I think. Jessica, their mother, was, was standing right next to her to, to kind of give her support. Um, as Taylor sat on the stand, handcuffed behind the back, crying or at least appearing to cry, sobbing at some points. Um, we couldn't see any tears, I should note. Jessica said the same thing, actually, Jessica Brooks. She didn't see any actual tears, but Taylor's face was contorted and she did look very emotional. At times she was looking down and muttering to herself, it looked like. I thought, is she praying? It was hard to tell. Um, so anyway, so 
um, first was Emily, and then after that was um, Jessica, and she, I think she started out by saying, uh, oh, you think it's about, you think everything is about you, you know, I got news for you, it's not all about you, this is about Reagan, you know, my baby Reagan, you know, um, and my grandbaby Braxlyn Sage, and then she went on to kind of list all the relationships of the people in her family who lost, you know, a sister, an aunt, a niece, that kind of thing, a granddaughter, a great granddaughter. Um, it was very emotional. And then she said, she called Parker an evil piece of flesh demon, and said, you know, you, you killed killed my daughter and and ripped my granddaughter um, from her womb. Um, she said, you know, you think. Um, nobody cares about if you next time you find yourself or whenever you find yourself um, feeling sorry for yourself and thinking that nobody cares about you know that that is true um, so it was it wasn't angry but it was basically the message was we're gonna remember Reagan and Braxlin and then they you know make sure that their memories live on and everyone remembers how beautiful they are and as for you if anybody ever brings you up and she, again, that's where she called her an evil piece of flesh demon. I'm going to make sure they know how evil you are. Um, and then after that, it was a statement from uh, Red, but it was from Homer Hancock, Reagan's widower. It was read by, I think, his sister-in-law. And it talked about how he never got to meet his daughter, Braxlyn Sage, alive. Um, he'll never know what color her eyes would turn out to be or hear her say, I love you, Daddy. Uh, and that whenever now um, he and and their daughter, their five-year-old, want to visit mommy, they have to pack up and go to the cemetery to visit her. So it was a brief statement, but very, very powerful. Um, and with that, that's when the judge said, all right, you can remove her and take her to death row, which I heard as get her out of my courtroom and get her out of this county. That's what it felt like. And I think a lot of people heard him say, remove her and take her to death row, and they knew exactly you know, I think everybody read that. I think it's like the tone of voice someone uses sometimes that uh, it portrays like something differently. Um, and so even when you meant you were looking for that word and you said powerful, like I'm mm -hmm. sure that um, the statement from um, from Reagan's mom mm -hmm. was powerful and, and just in all those victim statements. Yeah. Yeah. She said after she she wasn't sure she could do it. She told us. Because she, you know, she didn't want to get emotional, too emotional. I mean, she, it's a weird place to be, you know, um, no one, anyone, no, nothing that anybody, not a place anybody wants to be in, having to address your killer. But she wanted to be able to tell Taylor Parker all of those things, what she thinks of her, how she plans to, you know, make sure that her, her daughter and granddaughter's memories are, are um, preserved and, and, in some ways that everyone remembers how beautiful they were and hopefully never speak of Parker unless it's to remind people of how evil she is. So it was a message that she wanted to get through and she, I, she, I think she did a great job. She, she stayed, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Composed, yeah. yeah, yeah. And Parker did look up at her a few times. Um, but a lot of times she was looking down and doing that muttering. And then so, um, I mean, also this is just like one last tidbit, um, just from hearing um, some of the things she, sa she said during her um, statement. It's just like ex yeah. describing um, like the gruesomeness of, of um, you know, Parker pulling, you know, the, the fact that she'll never see her grandbaby um, and, and how it was ripped out of uh, Reagan's body. And, and that's just, you know, for us viewers here um, and, and me as well, personally, you know, we were just hearing that. That's just like uh, you can only picture or imagine what that would look like. But everyone in that courtroom, the jury has been able to see the, these pictures and what that actually looked like over this, you know, past two months time span of evidence that was shown in depth and in detail. Um, it, so, it, yeah, it's just very, um, it's tough to hear, but it, it, even tougher to imagine that you guys have all seen that firsthand and up front and up close. Um, well, I think that's why there was such a sense of relief in the courtroom afterward, because it was such, 
such a horrible crime to begin with. And then a, a two month trial, like it lasted two months. There were 26 days of testimony that I counted, um, over a thousand pieces of evidence. Um, so not just the trauma of the crime, which is heinous enough, um, but the trauma of the trial um, and everybody just wanting to get to this point where justice is served. And so when that verdict was read, um, huge sense of relief in that room. Yeah. And then so I wanted to ask you, like, um, for maybe people who don't know, if you're able to maybe shed some light. I know I think it was um, the prosecution kind of gave this, uh, this painted this picture a little bit before um, they rested. But a little bit more, can you go in depth in regards to, like, moving forward? What would happen next to Parker? How does this, you know, work going on to death row? Um, just for someone who's never seen someone sentenced to death before, could you shed, shed some light on that? So do you mean what life is like at death? Not life itself, but, um, you know, being sentenced, how long does it take until, you know, they're, you know, given their last meal and, and everything oh, from it's there it's it takes place. Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. Could be 20 years. I mean, the average right now is something like 20 years for the six women who are currently on death row. Uh, one of them's been there 27 years. Um, the one that's been there the least amount of time has been there 10 years. So it's, it, you know, there's an automatic appeal in a, in a capital murder case where someone is sentenced to death in Texas. So that's going to have to happen. Um, after that, there could be other appeals, you know, um, you know, that's up to, to Taylor Parker and her attorneys if she chooses to do that. So, you know, there's no telling. Um, and it, yeah, you can't, it, it would be impossible, I would say, to, guess right now how long it may be uh, before an execution date would be set there are a lot of people um other than the six women you know there's there are a lot of people on death row in texas i want to say i didn't count how many were actually on death row there though it's mostly men obviously i think it's like 3.1 percent of the texas death row prison population is women so um, but anyway, they execute, I think last year, this year they've executed, the state has executed four people, including one woman. No, the one woman was 2014. But anyway, four people have, it's t November, 2022. Four people have been executed. There's one more, or maybe it's five and there's one more before the end of the year. None of them are the women on death row. Um, so, but in previous years, um, they've executed, I think they still execute more have executed more certainly more women than any other state um they just have a lot of people on death row and they all have to go through those appeals processes so there's really no telling okay all right i think that's uh, something maybe a lot of people who have tuned in um would learn that maybe they didn't know that before but um also something also as you brought up the appeals um i think i recall from donald Britton's coverage that speaking to the defense team one of the defense team um members that uh they're going to look to uh, apply for that appeal. And then someone here in our comments um, actually asked this question, um, asking if Parker would get a new defense team after they apply that apply for yeah. that appeal. Can you tell us a little bit about that or if you know anything about how that would work? Just a little bit. Um, I, the attorney who represented Parker during her trial is it was qualified as a, a defense attorney for capital murder cases, but you have to be qualified for appeals in capital murder cases, and Harrelson is not, so she will be getting a new attorney. I don't know who that is yet. Um, I don't know if that's even determined yet. I know the appeal is automatic. That's in the law, um, so it will be reviewed. The case will be reviewed in the form of an appeal, but as far as who that attorney is, it'll probably, you know, I'm assuming it might be with a capital project team, um, experienced in in appealing those kinds of cases so i'm sure we'll report it when it, we have that information so all right well we are coming to a little bit of a close here I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys our web page right here ktalnews.com where we have in-depth coverage all the way from day one we've been following this case and you can catch up and see all of the details uh, that Carolyn has been able to provide giving you a full inside look of that courtroom day by day and what's gone down um, we've done all the uh, every Friday at four o'clock we've done a breakdown live on Facebook so you can also get caught up there as well 
Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and see if maybe there was any last minute questions in our comment section that you guys have asked um, to see if we can answer them before we jump off here for one of the last times. Um, and I want to lastly um, just say thank you to all of you guys for tuning in and staying tuned uh, for um, our in-depth coverage here. You know, we, we know at times it's been hard to hear, um, but we appreciate you guys for sticking with us. Um, no questions I see here, but I, I'm going to see. Okay, yeah. yeah oh, I was going to say, yeah. probably got my nose to come up <laughs> from closing <laughs> arguments. Uh, um, here, a couple of things I highlighted from the, the state's closing arguments um, that really stood out to me was, one where Lauren Richards was telling the jury that in her last minutes we'll never know what Reagan saw, but what we do know is that the baby, baby Braxlin, spent her last, her living actually, and dying moments um, in the arms of the person who killed her. Um, and that's when, that is actually when Lauren uh, Richards said, um, if anything else in the world deserves the death penalty, that's it. Um, she said, in what case would you give it if not this one? Um, she also asked the jury to just give the family the peace that that Taylor Parker is no longer calling the shots, a reference to all the scheming and, a, you know, Taylor seeming to think that she was the, the you know, in charge, even in the jail. Um, Lauren said she's made every decision up to this point. It's not her choice now. You're going to get, make the choice to send her to death row. Um, so that was the, how she wrapped up. Um, and then... Then it's going to my notes about what Jeff Harrelson said. Like I said, someone, how he was saying, you know, somebody, everybody was waiting for somebody to do something, but nobody actually did anything. And he actually said if someone had said something um, and changed the course of this, would it have changed the course of this? He said, we'll never know. So he's trying to kind of instill, implant doubt into the jury's minds, the jurors' minds about, um, you know, how culpable, I guess, Parker was if other people had taken action maybe this wouldn't have happened. Um, oh, she, oh, he also talked about how, you know, some of the jail calls we heard between Parker and her kids um, since she's been at the detention center um, where she's, you know, admonishing her daughter not to be snooping. She was trying to find out where the family was taking them on a, on a little trip and the little girl was, you know, it was kind of cute. She was trying to figure out where, the, where they were going for their little vacation. Um, so she was saying she was going to look in the in her, I think, her grandmother's calendar. So Harrelson said, well, look, she's even trying to, even though she's behind bars, accused of this horrible crime, she's trying to teach her kids from, right from wrong. Um, I want to get to the good part. I mean, Kelly, Kelly Crisp's final rebuttal was stunning. And I feel like I didn't give it justice. <laughs> That's why I'm looking at my notes like, ah. Um, she said, uh, yeah, trying to, uh, talking about Harrelson, trying to claim that she wasn't going to be a future uh, danger in prison. She said, you know, um, that it was a joke, um, that all the manipulation she did um, with the jail, trying to frame the jail fellow inmates at the by state. Um, Phyllis Dawson, Granny, who was one of the inmates that she tried to kind of hire, she offered money to um, distribute these con fake confession letters, pinning someone else for the crime, basically, and that she called these inmates that she tried to um, rope into these schemes that could put them in jail for life, you know, major crime, you know, trying to frame someone for murder, um, that she called these fellow inmates trash. Um, I know you have to wrap it up. No, it's okay. I actually want to do something before we close. Um, so I want to do something before we close this. This is something that I just noticed in our comment section, um, actually from Homer Hancock. So um, I want you to listen to this, uh, Carolyn, so we can maybe address this now before we hop off so we can do that in our live. Yeah. So it seems that he has stated that um, Kinley pulling up pregnant mom shirts is not the truth oh. so um i mean you not pulling up i don't think okay but maybe if i said that i apologize okay so i just want to address it here so maybe we can just uh dive deep a little bit into this mm -hmm. so is, it, is he saying that you know that is not the truth mm -hmm. i don't know where you got that from oh. um you know so i just wanted to write that wrong if maybe we are incorrect in that position well, from no, saying that said it but maybe there's a disagreement between them that that actually happened i don't know that is what, what Jessica Brooks said on the stand, but 
um, maybe there's a disagreement about how it was described. Okay, maybe about like what exactly that looks like and the wording of that may be a little incorrect. So we're going to write that wrong and, and say that. Um, no, she really did say. Yeah. She asks. I'm just saying what Jessica said. But like I said, maybe there's a disagreement in their perspectives of what, you know? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to be able to yes. address that here on our live yeah. right before we hop off. So um, we got that that cleared out, that yeah. that aired out. So um, all right, so I think uh, we are gonna close things off here. One last time, I'm gonna show you guys our KTAL News webpage. You can go here for all the details and depth coverage from day one and everything that's happened. Um, if you guys have any more questions, you can put them in the comment section and we'll be answering them afterwards as well if we did not get to them. Um, any last words or last comments that you want to add, Carolyn? Well, I did actually pull up what the Kelly Chris saying. Um, how many times a day do you think that happens? And uh, she's talking about how Jessica testified that she still tries to text her daughter. And then she goes on to say, um, you got a little girl lifting up the shirts of women to see if her stomach is cut, and she doesn't like to see people in red because of her mama. So that's Chris. That's Kelly Crisp, the prosecutor, saying that. Not me getting it wrong. I just want to be clear about that. Yeah. Still, I understand it's upsetting, but that's what the prosecutor said, and that is what Jessica said on the stand. Um, and I think other than that, the details of uh, the closing arguments, I think the, the biggest highlights of those moments are on the uh, are in the story and I'm also working to publish right now a story about what life on death row is is like um, and about how Taylor Parker is about to become the seventh woman on death row right now and um, you know what the other women are in there for and and more details on that so that'll be on our website here shortly well awesome I just wanted to give you a moment to be able to clear that air I appreciate yeah. you for um, well, going back in your notes and, yeah and of course you know he's Homer's taking care of that baby and he knows his child. So if he says that's not what happened, I give that as much weight as I give, you know, what Jessica Brooks said. So I'm not I'm not saying that's what happened. I wasn't there. I'm just relaying what was said in court. So certainly I hope I hope that's understood. I'm not trying to <laughs> I'm not trying to make a claim other than what was said in court. All right, and you can, um, like Carolyn said, you can stay tuned with more um, coverage that's coming your way on KTALnews.com. Again, thank you all for tuning in and joining us for this live in-depth coverage. Hope you guys have a great and rest of your day.